Games provoke many emotions, excitement, fear, outrage, and very, very occasionally, pride? Not terribly often, it must be said, which is why in this video, everyone from Outside Extra and Outside Xbox is going to talk about the single game-related thing they did in 2023 that they're most proud of. It doesn't have to be related to a game that came out this year. In fact, none of them are, but they're all celebrations of the hobby and the weird and unexpected avenues for personal growth and achievement it opens up. And they're all things that we did in 2023. Here are the gaming achievements of this year that we're most proud of. Let me tell you about uh, COVID lockdown and a slight problem I developed uh, during that time. During that period of uncertainty, when the world was a terrifying place, uh, I sort of retreated into a into nostalgia because that was a safe, understandable time, you know. And one of the things I'm super nostalgic for is arcades and arcade machines. You know, there'd be fighting games that were you know just way, way beyond what you could play on the SNES and you know there'd be racing games and things like that. I remember like playing Daytona USA which is my all time favourite racing game in the arcades. It, it never got a, a home port, like a faithful home port until the Xbox 360. So really it was something that was confined to the arcades in, in that level of quality and I remember playing it and then getting back and playing uh, the Mode 7 racing game Street Racer on my SNES and I remember my dad sticking his head around my bedroom door and saying not quite the same, is it? And he was absolutely right, because arcade games were just so much better. Daytona, big, big deal for me in terms of uh, arcade racing games and Sega racing games in general. And what you'll remember if you were around arcades at the time is that you used to get these sort of twin cabinets, basically. There'd be two racing seats with steering wheels, force feedback steering wheels, big CRT monitors and great sound systems and stuff. For years, I wanted a, a to own like a twin racing cab. They're a sort of, they're a relic now, but they, you know, they have such a, a sort of a, a firm place in my heart. And this year was finally the year that I bought not one, but I now own two of these twin racing cabs. But the first one I bought was was Le Mans. Le Mans 24. Le Mans is uh, a game made by Sega in 1997, Model 3 hardware, so the same hardware as Virtual Fighter 3. Um, is the generation of hardware after Daytona. It is not a beloved game, really. Uh, it's a bit strange. It's a good game, I think, but it's like handling wise, it's not as good as Daytona or Sega Rally. But what I love about it, it's got some really, well, for a start, I'm an enormous motorsport fan, an enormous fan of Le Mans. I've been to Le Mans multiple times. I love that race. But one of the really cool things about that game is it, it did this sort of day night cycle thing. So once the, the cabinet was sort of fired up, the race started, right? Whether you were playing it or not. And then when you put your money in, you weren't starting a race. You just started in the pit lane during the 24 hours. It was already in progress and maybe it was the evening and you started your race in the evening and you would transition into the night. Or maybe it's the morning and you'd start in the night and transition into the daytime. And that applied to either of the two players at the same time. So it's got this really weird, like unique live race sort of environment that always absolutely um, transfixed me. And anyway, one of these came up for sale on eBay and it was a sort of slightly busted like one of the game boards wasn't working properly, so graphically there were glitches and stuff. And I knew that if I didn't buy this machine, it was gonna get parted out, right? Like they were just gonna go, well, no one wants a Le Mans game, so let's just take it apart, let's rip the screens out, let's rip the, you know, whatever else is left in this in this cabinet, let's take it all apart and sell it for parts. And I was like, I've gotta buy this. I've gotta rescue this game. The slight problem with that is that no one has room for this thing in their house. Simply live, in the game. Simply live inside the game, yeah. And you know, when I explained it to my wife, there was a real danger I would be living in the game. Um, I, I bought this thing um, and I, I chatted to Loading Bar. So that is where the Le Mans twin cabinet lives at the moment. It still needs a bit of work, like the, the top light isn't working so I could do with fixing that. And the force feedback stuff had been already been pulled out of the cabinet. So it plays, but it doesn't have the force feedback it used to. I'd love to get that back up and running again. But these things are sort of, work in progress like nostalgia projects. So yeah, that exists, you can play it. If you are in Brighton in the UK or nearby, you can go to Learning Bar in Brighton, you can sit and play on this bizarre Le Mans game that no one really cares about. But I, I care deeply about it and I was really pleased to rescue it. So I saved that game and then I, I very foolishly also saved a Ferrari F355, which is in a lot worse state in terms of bits that are broken. So I'm gradually repairing that in my friend's garage. This was the year that I finally got hold of a, 
I originally thought I'd buy a Daytona because Daytona is, is, is the GOAT, but they don't come around that often. And really, in a way, you know, there's always going to be Daytona machines because that game is such a classic. But I think there are vanishingly rare examples of Sega Le Mans 24 from 1997. But there is one, and I own it. It's mine. So this year, the PSVR 2 came out and I was really excited when they announced that uh, Beat Saber, that was like the one game that I was really, really, really wanting to try. Um, it was coming to PSVR 2, they were updating it and bringing it out again. Uh, when I got into it, I really got into it. <laughs> Uh, for those of you who've uh, seen our Show of the Weekend episode on it, I became an expert level player in Beat Saber and it feels amazing. For those of you who don't know, two lightsabers, arrows on blocks, you hit the block with the colour in the direction of the arrow. As it gets harder, there's more things, it's faster, you crisscross, etc, all sorts of things. <laughs> Getting really into a game to that level um, was really satisfying like and it was you know as someone who makes a lot of content about video games often we're playing games to be able to cover them but this one was mostly just for me I just wanted to get good at it for me and it kind of it scratched an itch as someone I used to do a lot of dance uh, it scratched that itch it's basically kind of learning a little bit of choreography and it's really fun I really enjoyed uh, also being in Seattle and finding an arcade machine of it and being everyone hey watch me do this <laughs> however Getting to expert is not actually my greatest achievement because I'm now expert plus. Hey! hey! Thanks for that rousing applause, everyone. I don't know uh, what that means, but it sounds good. It's the highest level. Easy, normal, hard, expert, expert plus. <laughs> the expert plus is like what all the pros are playing and I've got to that level uh, for some of the songs. I'm really pleased. It made me feel very proud because I often see like people playing games to those really high levels and I think, how do they do that? How do they get to that? So to be able to find my niche and the thing that I can do and get to that level and just be like, yeah, I can do this. I'm, I'm able to, you know, I found, I found the thing that I'm good at um, and I'm having a lot of fun with it. I've also, you know, it's been, it's brilliant exercise. Uh, it's a lot of fun. Like when, once I finish playing it, I'm like, oh, I enjoyed that. It's not stressful. Like even if you're like messing up and just practicing, um, just moving around, get those, gets those endorphins going. It's not Dark Souls level, like when you're like, ah, oh, I can't get this boss. If you can't get that thing, you're like, I'll get it tomorrow because you can feel yourself more easily getting better because you can feel your body moving quicker and all that sort of stuff. So yeah, it's, it's a really satisfying game to play and it's really nice to kind of like watch other players now, like the kind of pro Beat Saber YouTubers and stuff and look at that and go, maybe I will actually reach that one day, like, because I'm nearly there, nearly. Like, some of the songs are harder than others, uh, and the Expert Plus ones that I've done are the kind of like, welcome to Expert Plus mode, uh, but I'm really looking forward to being hopefully even better by the end of the year, and I'm really pleased, and yeah, Beat, Beat Saber is the, the new thing I do now, <laughs> so yay! Deadlands takes place in the Weird West, a treacherous frontier where legends are born and nightmares are real. Here, five wild cards come together to seek fortune, justice and revenge, and the woman behind a mysterious help wanted ad. So the thing that I'm most proud of this year in gaming isn't a video game, but rather a, a tabletop game, um, is that I DM'd my first campaign of anything ever, which was Deadlands. 22, 23, Plus five is 28. Yeah, the Sasquatch bursts. <laughs> <laughs>
this like, That's like what it says said. on the tin. Gore and fur and bone just smacks against the inside. Yeah, I'd never DM'd run a game of anything before ever in my life, ever. The first minute of me DMing is the first minute of the first Deadlands video. I tried to get a like a practice game going, and as with all tabletop games, people were like, yeah, 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 let's do that, let's do that. And then they're like, oh, I can't do this day, and I can't do this day, and the calendars didn't align, and then we were filming it the next day, and I was like, well, I guess, guess we're just going in. So I was very, very nervous. It went well, and I was proud with how the story played out, all the characters and stuff, because before you do it, there's no real way of knowing how it's gonna go. Like, you can prepare as much as you want, but obviously the point of tabletop role-playing games is that the players are almost as much uh, in charge of the story as you are. They can take it in completely different directions. There's no way to prepare for a lot of that stuff, so you have no way of knowing how it's going to go. And having played D&D and various other tabletop RPGs like Blades in the Dark, as run by Luke, it's always seemed to me to be just an incredible amount of work and stress to run a game and to sort of have a story that's coherent and make sense in the whole, but also allow the players enough agency to do what they want to do as well. I just couldn't understand how anyone could do that, and particularly um, the way that Luke and Johnny run their games, which felt so like free and open as the players, and yet had such satisfying stories. Now you know it's easy. But now I know it's the easiest thing in the world. <laughs> a baby could do it. A stupid baby. <laughs> it was, you know, as a short 10 episode season, with a sort of a beginning and a middle and an end. And I was particularly worried about the sort of the final episode where everything came together and there was like a twist ending and I was like, oh, is this gonna be satisfying? Are people gonna enjoy this? And then like watching the live chat as it went out and everyone was like, oh, this is great, I'm loving this. This is a satisfying conclusion to the story. And then sort of going online and seeing all the kind of the theories and the fan fiction and this kind of uh, the analysis of the ending and, and people sort of talking about the characters and the motivations. and and things like that, it was incredibly satisfying to see people take the story that seriously, to take it to heart and to want to know more about it. Yeah, it was an incredibly gratifying thing to watch and it made me really want to do more of it. Um, and since we finished that, I've been publishing like fiction as well on, online, kind of emboldened um, by the re reaction to, uh, to Deadlands. So yeah, I've um, fully drunk my own Kool-Aid now, think I'm a brilliant storyteller. Um, won't hear any criticism fly into a m wild rage if I'm criticised in the slightest. Yeah, it was something that I was very nervous about doing, very worried it wouldn't go right, and extremely proud of how it turned out, thanks to uh, the amazing players that we had getting into it and, you know, playing along in, this, in the spirit of the thing, but also you know, I put a lot of hard work into it as well, and it paid off. And I think, you know, it's uh, a hard thing for me to do sometimes, to work hard at something and then go, yeah, I worked hard at that, and it worked, and it went well, and I should be proud of that. But I am, I'm proud of it. Good, nice. I'm right. Yeah. I can't think of a, a I can't think of a quick and simple way to do this. Last year, Mike said, and I think I've got this verbatim, if you want to get really weird, <laughs> you should download iRacing. So I was playing a lot of the F1 game, and Mike was like, hey, did you know that there's this whole other secret like racing game thing? It was like a members club. It's like you'd never find it by yourself. Someone who's already in has to sort of like open the door for you. And then, you know, so I walked into iRacing, and there's Mike in his rabbit mask and his gown, and he's like, <laughs> These are my associates. What's iRacing? Well, I bridle at iRacing being described as a game. Um, <laughs> it's a racing simulator. The thing that is novel about it, you can't just rock up and play it and have fun in a straightforward way. Races happen typically like every two hours. So you have to kind of time it. You have to sort of like plan your evening or your weekend around like taking part in one of these races. Your performance, especially how safely you drive, is very tightly regulated and scored. So if you want to like open up all the different cars and all the different series that the platform has, you have to drive very responsibly for weeks, basically. And there's something so broken in me that when I'm presented with something so, so like deliberately joyless, I'm like, finally, I like it. <laughs> I actually like it.
so fine. And what happened over the course of this year was I settled into one series that I truly, truly, truly love, which is the F4 series. The F4 races are perfect. The car, it, it looks basically like a Formula One car, so if you use your imagination, it's a bit like you're in one. But they're not so fast and powerful that you crash within one second of like nudging the throttle. The racing is very tight. It feels very, very fast. When you're doing it, it's unbelievably exciting um, and, and just feels absolutely tremendous. Well, this all led up to the thing that I am genuinely most proud of in gaming, although it's not, it is a simulation platform, in 2023, which was I qualified in pole position for one of my F4 races. It was at Spa, a very famous circuit that is really fun to drive. It's kind of all that goes all up and down, a bit like a roller coaster. If a roller coaster didn't have any loops or particularly banked curves and only went up and down a little bit. I remember like after getting this qualifying pole lap, going and looking at the top split where the people with the highest like driver rating would get getting and they were still like a, a second a second and a half clear of my time so it's not like a world record time or anything but for my split it was it was it was the fastest one and the the pride that i felt was such that immediately i saved the replay that's the footage you're seeing now the replay i saved looked at all looked at all different angles just admiring my handiwork so pleased with my lines luxuriating in how i managed to hook a lap together that wasn't like hamstrung by calamity or screwing something up. Just feeling pride, just feeling feeling really, really proud of having done that. I've won one iRacing race before. This was the first time I'd ever been on pole and it actually felt like more of an achievement because the races are so chaotic. You can sometimes get really lucky and like luck into a very high position or a podium but there's there's not really anywhere to hide in in qualifying when you when you're qualifying you're just trying to go as fast as possible because everyone who is doing i racing is doing it seriously that's one of the things that makes it so hard to progress is that the like the general ability level on there is so high so like any like win you can get any kind of incremental gain it feels amazing so yeah i got a pole lap on spa and felt uh, unbelievably proud of having uh, done that where did you finish in the race <laughs> the race uh, the race went awfully there was a big crash turn one and I took some damage and I think I finished, I can't remember, not, no, not well, not, it didn't go well. I had, a, honestly, the first five seconds of that race, credible feeling. Couldn't see another car in front of me, <laughs> whoosh. But then cars, all the cars piled into the back of me and um, it went, yeah, it went terribly, terribly wrong. <laughs> this happens when, when you're doing really well in this game, like you have to concentrate in these races for such a long time and you can't make any mistakes and just any like, just a little nudge of the, one of the pedals or the wheel, it's like, and, and you're sunk and that's it and you can't, and then you have to, that's your evening, you're done. So, so like the level of concentration is intense and if you find yourself running in like third or second or something, like it's just like, dum, 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 dum. just like, oh my God, oh my God. You make a little mistake, you're looking at your relatives times and you can see that like every lap, the person behind you is like gaining three tenths and you're like mentally doing the maths of how much longer there is in the race and like whether they're likely to catch you and you're like, okay, I'm gonna have to push, but my tires are going off and it's, yeah, it's it's genuinely very, very exciting. And I should say as well that by making this my most proud moment of 2023, I've quite cruelly taken something away from Mike because we we can't have two eye racing things in this video. It would be disgusting. But Mike actually did really an awesome thing in eye racing this year, which was he finished second in 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 his split at the Daytona 24 hours an, in, an endurance race that he did with a team of, of friends so he like drove for hours and hours and hours like through the night kind of swapping in and out of the car and yeah managed to bring it home in second which is just a titanic achievement achieving anything in i racing is an achievement there you go that's yeah the yeah but that but that's why i'm so proud of it of all the things i've ever done in my life it has the widest disparity between hardest to achieve and amount anyone will be impressed <laughs> like the gulf is this wide between those things. So that's why I'm doing this video now, to basically force you to listen. This has been very cathartic to me. I, all year long, I've wanted to force someone to listen. And now if you've made it to the end of this, you have listened. Sorry.
When I was informed that I would need to share a gaming achievement here in the hot seat, I thought, um, well, this evening, ahead of filming tomorrow, I'll go and play some Baldur's Gate and I'll finally seduce Astarion. And well, I got nowhere, so here I am to talk about Animal Crossing some more. Yay! <laughs> Obviously not a new game, but I am, in my defense, here to talk about the uh, Happy Holiday Paradise DLC, which came out somewhat later, <laughs> two years ago. Uh, this year I picked up Animal Crossing uh, sporadically, as I am want to do. I find it very comforting, I find it very reassuring, and, uh, and I love it. And what I really, really wanted to show somebody, anybody who would listen and watch, and that's you right now, is how bloody good I am at making holiday homes in the holiday home designing portion of Animal Crossing. So you should be looking at it right now. Don't look at me, look at my holiday homes. They're really, really good. The theming is excellent. Some of them have two floors, some of them have roommates, and they are all to a holiday home, absolutely exquisite. And my Christmas present to myself is getting to show you them now. There are very many from over the last couple of years. I guess I hadn't appreciated how very many and how very good they are until I went and uh, spoke to the little monkey guy who's like, hey, do you wanna do you wanna look at some of your old holiday homes? And I'm like, yes, please. And then I looked at the, the long, long catalogue of exquisite holiday homes that I have designed and furnished and they are lovely. I think you will agree. So that's my achievement. I'm here achieving all the time. When I look at my early holiday homes, I hadn't unlocked the dividing walls. I hadn't unlocked all kinds of like good things. They're trash. No, they're, they're not trash. They're good too, but obviously we've come a long way. And here in the year of our Lord 2023, they're better than they ever have been and will continue to be uh, into 2024 and beyond. What's your favorite? My favorite is a grocery store that I built for a couple of pals that just wanted to run a grocery store together. And so now I've got two roommates and they run a, an adorable little ja Japanese style convenience mart with a little kind of sushi counter. And uh, it's just, it's adorable. Like, I, you should be looking at it right now. Don't look at me. I can look see at, it's adorable. Look at it. How much time roughly does this one represent? Um, I couldn't tell you. I go into a sort of fugue <laughs> state and emerge on the other side of it. And then there's a holiday home. I'm, I'm sort of an artist like that. <laughs> I think cumulatively, all of these holiday homes amount to a, a, a vast time investment, but I will admit to a, a number of them having been created during lockdowns. So that's my excuse. I know Andy's got his fiction writing and, you know, Luke makes role-playing games and Mike rescues <laughs> injured <laughs> gaming machines. <laughs> gaming machines. <laughs> But I make holiday homes in, in Animal Crossing. It makes me happy. So those are the weird things in 2023 that we did in games that we are super proud of for whatever reason. What did you achieve this year in games that you're proud of? Sorry, that sounded very accusatory, didn't it? Like, <laughs> and what did you achieve? Huh? No, I genuinely want to know because I think it'll be interesting. I think the comment section for this video is going to be a good time and a good vibe. So yeah, head down there. And yeah, just shout shout what you what you did, what something that you, you did this year that you thought was pretty cool. If you enjoyed this video and you want to support the video work that we do, then you can by going to patreon.com slash OX Club, where you get access to uh, our Patreon and that sort of opens the door to our Discord. Uh, we all hang out on there, uh, as well as a, a great community of, of like-minded ox likers. That's outside Xbox, outside extra likers, not like ox, like the livestock. Maybe some of them like livestock. Most of them probably like livestock. Who doesn't like livestock? This video's over. Bye. <laughs>